August 1, 1995, survivor David Stein, interviewer Sharon Steinberg Perlman, Roslyn, New York, in, in English. Tuesday, August 1, 1995, survivor David Stein, interviewer Sharon Steinberg Perlman, Roslyn Heights, New York. Um, can you please tell us your name? My name is David Stein. Can you spell that, please? And the spelling of David is David, but Stein is S-T-E-I-N. And where are you from? When, when's your birth date? My birth date is uh, December the 5th, and I was born in 1929 or 1930. Is there a discrepancy in... There is no discrepancy, but officially the documents show 1929, but there's a reason for that particular date, and I'll go into it later on. Okay, and where were you born? I was born in a small town of Rachov in the Carpathian Mountains, also known as uh, Zakarpatsky, Ukraine, and which is a, an appendage to when they created Czechoslovakia, they added that particular region it was Czechia, Slovakia, and the Carpathian region, and that made Czechoslovakia. Do you have any other names, any other nicknames that you were known by as a child? Yes, I was known as Dutsi, which in fact is uh, a 10-liter barrel. It's a round barrel usually associated with fat children are called nicknamed, as I was nicknamed Dutsi. Uh, how old are you now? I am now uh, 64 or 65. Depending on. Right, depend, depending. Officially, I'm 65. Can you tell me a little bit about what life was like in Rakhova when you were growing up? Uh, well, uh, basically, uh, we, the Stein family was a large family in Rakhov. And we really came there by way of Franz Joseph of Austria. My great-grandfather, who was a Stein, had served in uh, the army of Franz Joseph, and uh, the Carpathian region was part of the Austrian Empire, Austrian-Hungarian Empire. And in order to settle it with loyal subjects, he, the uh, monarchy would grant tracts of land, and he was given a tract of land in Rachov. And that's how the family came to settle there. And uh, uh, he married uh, a woman by the name of Gietl. Her maiden name was Zweig. Can you and spell that, please? Z-W-I-E-G, Zweig. And um, they had uh, settled. Oh, wait a minute. They, my great-grandfather, I don't know any part of his history, but I'm really talking about my grandfather now the son of the great-grandfather who settled there. And um, uh, he, his name was David, and he married Gietl. And they had uh, seven sons and two daughters. And um, everybody lived in the Carpathian region of Rachov and uh, were engaged in farming, which was very unusual for Jewish people, but it really wasn't that unusual in that particular region because land, basically they were granted land, so they made use of the land. Uh, we had an apple orchard, uh, also uh, vegetable farms, and we had uh, uh, cows and chickens and lambs and all this sort. Uh, and the, the main family lived on the main street of Rachov. When you say the main family, who, who the main that? family, the branches was my my uh, my grandmother. My grandfather had died before I was uh, born, so I didn't know him. I'm named after him, and so the grandmother lived in the main house, which was built by her father, her her father-in-law, and we so the house fronted the main street, and it had a huge uh, backyard, it was a well in the center of it. And there was uh, houses that were built for the sons and the daughters as they got married. So in this particular courtyard, 
was my father's house. His brother's, uh, his youngest brother, his nickname was Loyush, but he was uh, uh, Leib in, in Yiddish. And uh, his uh, youngest sister, who lived in the main house, was my grandmother. And that was the courtyard. And a few houses down the road was the older sister, Leia. And then on the, on the street that ran along the, the brook where most of the land was, was the oldest of the brother, Moshe Itzik. And he was the, uh, actually, he was like the boss of the family because being the oldest, and he was the farmer. In, in your immediate family, who did you live with? We lived with my uh, mother, my father, and my uh, two sisters and a brother. So there was four of us. And what, what were your brothers and sisters' names? Uh, my brother's name is Emil, mm -hmm. and his Jewish name is Ezra. And then the next one is uh, uh, Judy, and her name is Yitta in, in Yiddish. And my younger sister, whose name is Sima, and her name is Stephanie, and then, of course, me. How many Jews were in your town? How, how big was your town and how many Jews well, were there? Well, I don't have an exact count. And uh, the only thing I, I can tell you, we had a yeshiva, which was uh, a regional yeshiva, a very famed rabbi. The Rachav uh, rabbi had a yeshiva. But we had uh, three synagogues. So that will approximate how many Jews, because every Jew belonged to a synagogue. So we had the old shul, the altar shul, and then we had the Altanaya Shul, meaning the son of the rabbi established his own uh, uh, synagogue, his, his own congregation, and then was the other shul. And it was known as the other shul because they did, were not a follower of the rabbi, so they were sort of separated, more modern. Did they have a rabbi? Oh, yeah, they had a rabbi, but he wasn't a renowned rabbi, so he re the shul didn't have a name as far as I know. It was the other shul. That's what it was called. So I would assume there were roughly 200 uh, in each shul. So you estimate about 600 Jews in, in Rachov. And how many people were in Rachov? Uh, Rachov, uh, again, the, 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 the population of Rachov was roughly 10,000. But of the 10,000, 5,000 literally lived on the mountainsides. They were potato farmers, by and large. And and loggers. There was uh, mountainous regions and the population engaged in, in logging. So all winter they would be up in the forest cutting the trees and with the uh, spring thaw they would float the logs, make them into uh, huge floats and two men would, would uh, float each one of those floats down the river. They had a, it had a large dam and the dam was then opened in the spring as the, as the thaw be, began. And, so, and in the summer, they were engaged in sheep herding and potato farming. What, was, what other town was Rachov near? What large town was it near? Well, it, 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 near as to American nearness, it would be Siget, which uh, is roughly about uh, 40 miles from Rachov. Which direction? Uh, which direction going towards Romania. I really, I, I can tell you that we were at the tip, or uh, Rachov was at the tip. There was only two other towns past Rachov, which shot it into Poland. So this was going the other way, going towards uh, Romania and Hungary. And again, the Romanian-Hungarian border was always mixed up. We never knew who was governing that particular region, depending on who, who had troops there at that particular time. What did your father do? Uh, my father and his older brother were artisans. The local population uh, wore uh, ceremonial vests, which were made out of uh, sheepskins. So what they would do, they, they would slaughter the sheep, they would then uh, cure the skins and make them pure white, and they would cut uh, the the uh, sheepskin into a vest, and the entire vest was embroidered. It was particularly important for brides to wear that, because it had uh, 
uh, many symbols, symbols of fertility, symbols of good luck, and so, and so uh, my father's uh, vests were particularly prized possessions. A vest of that nature would take somewhere between eight and nine months of work, so that not too many were produced. But his brother was also a, an artisan in making the local vests. So that, that's what their, their basic occupation. And farming at the same time, they, they did additional farming. Would you consider your, your family well-to-do? Yes, we, we were well-to-do. Uh, we, uh, well, we had our own houses, and, and the, we had the main house. And we had no shortage. Uh, I don't remember any shortage of food. Uh, there was uh, things that we never did, is like wear shoes in the summer, because that was considered a, a waste. So the summertime, right after Pesach, the shoes came off, and we were barefoot. But I don't think it really had to do with uh, uh, having the money to buy shoes or not having. That was the custom in, in the area, and that's the, what we did. And uh, we, uh, we I, I remember happy times. You know, basically, what we did is the, the boys went to Cheder, which is Hebrew school, and the girls were given uh, lessons, piano lessons, uh, painting, thing, artistic, artistic uh, endeavors. They were taught uh, artistic uh, uh, occupations. Also darning, they were taught to darn. They were also taught to do needlepoint, and the subject matter was always very important you know, of, of what the needle point was going to say when it was finished. So that, that is the earliest uh, memory that I have of Rachov. What kind of education did you have besides the cheder? Did you have a well, secular education? My education okay. was interrupted at uh, age 11. And prior to that, I would go half a day to public school, and the rest of the time was back to Hebrew school, the cheder. And all day Sunday was Cheder, so the only free time we had was Friday afternoon and Saturday Shabbos, which we went to shul. Did you come from an observant family? Yes. Uh, uh, my father was observant, although not quite observant enough for my uncle Shia. Uh, he really was an observant Jew, and then there was some friction as regards to that. And ultimately, Shia went to the other shul. So. We know he wasn't quite observant enough for Shia, but he was observant. He had a he had a beard, not a full-grown beard, more beard like mine, a little little bit uh, more grown than that. Uh, had wore hat covering all the time. Wore his clothing was always dark. Well, so were all the rest of the men. And we had a kosher home, and we went to shul every Friday and Saturday and every holiday. So that that's uh, the kind of family that we came from, and then. Uh, uh, Saturday afternoons, we would gather in my grandmother Gietel's uh, house. She had a, um, a couch in, in this huge room, which was really a kitchen. And in the, ca the couch would open up, and it was, it was a wooden couch would, would open up, pull out, and children were put in a row to sleep. So sometimes you had three or four children sleep uh, Saturday afternoon. But that room was particularly uh, well attended. It had tea. So they would serve hot tea in the winter and the fall by placing, they would fire up the oven on Friday. So Friday, very early in the morning, they would make a, a potato, a ripionic, they would call it. And uh, thereafter, they would uh, bake the challah. And as a result, the oven stayed hot. So a churn was placed inside the oven, and on top of the oven, covered with blankets or a, a, a feather a quilt, which would keep the tea hot. And then everybody would gather in my grandmother's house and have tea after, after the Shabbos meal. So that was like the favorite uh, room of the entire family. And we used to get together with cousins and the uncles. And at times, they talked politics. And uh, there were heated political discussions. Sometimes even fights broke out. 
Was there talk about Israel or Palestine? Well, uh, we, we didn't know Israel, but we did know Palestine. There were, there were two organizations which were frowned upon by both the other shul and the, sh the other shul that we went to. They were considered uh, heretics. And, um, Which organizations were those? Was, they were both Zionist youth organizations. One was called Betar, and one was called Shomer Hatzair. Did you belong to one of those? I belonged, and my brother belonged. And my brother belonged to uh, Betar, which was the more orthodox, uh, right, uh, leaning right uh, organization. And I belonged to one called Shomer Hatzair. But basically, they had the same aim. They, they were trying to uh, give us a feeling of belonging to a land. And uh, what we would do is uh, sometimes we would go mountain climbing and sleep over in the mountains as part of, part of the uh, organization, group living. Was this boys and girls mixed? No, there were boys only. The girls were not, uh, did not belong to this organization. They were organizations for boys. And they had... Uh, uh, rooms. Each one had a, a room uh, that they would that we would meet. You know, in between the regular school, which ended at 12 o'clock, and Cheder, which started at 2 o'clock, we would attend these meetings. And uh, at these meetings, they they would tell stories. They would tell stories about uh, Israel, which was entirely different. Not Israel, uh, Palestine, which was different to what we learned in Cheder. So how they, is it different? Well, it, it was different because they were discussing uh, uh, the uh, war of the Jews in, uh, in, in terms which did not include God. So it was different in that sense. It was more secular and it was more nationalistic. And we were given little pins to wear to identify which organization we belonged to. And, uh, uh, and e eventually, these spins became uh, uh, a, a means by uh, so that the uh, Gentile boys would attack us. And they they uh, found it offensive, so we had to stop wearing the spins. Did, what was your connection with the non-Jewish community? It was it was very very little. Uh, all my friends were Jewish, and the the non-Jewish boys, for some reason did not associate with us. We, we were sort of, we were in town, but we were, we were not in town. Did they go to the same school? That they you went to the same school in the morning, and so they the also continued morning. in the afternoon. And uh, so we basically uh, didn't play together. We, we, we participated in, uh, in uh, school sports, which was soccer, also participated in the school play, which was performed in the uh, cinema. And that play took place on Mother's Day. And so that's the only uh, social interaction that we really had. Because at the time, we really didn't have any time to form really deep friendships with the non-Jewish boys, because we went off to Cheder, and we had our holidays. And uh, they, they, they did their own thing. But I felt no hostility. You know, it was just we sort of lived, lived separately. There was, there was no open hostility at that particular period. The same thing with your parents' generation? They didn't uh, relate to the non-Jewish people? Well, my mother had a very close friend across the street which, who was uh, a Hungarian native, her and her husband, and they were the closest of friends. And um, uh, so I, I know that there were people who had friends uh, who were non-Jewish, but as far as the, we were concerned, as children, we didn't have it. You know, we, we just didn't question it. We didn't think about it. When did you first experience any anti-Semitism as a kid? Well, uh, Czechoslovakia was dismembered in 1939. And uh, soon after that, uh, we were cut lo loose. And the region became known as the Zakarpatsky Rus. We were known as the Carp Carpathian Independent Republic. And uh, although they proclaimed themselves uh, as uh, independent, nobody had really granted them independence. And uh, immediately, uh, they, the nationalists 
accused the Jews of being loyal to Hungary and they they began to discriminate they they would a, a, a vandalize Jewish stores and uh, they they would uh, they would just be mean and they, and they would beat up on 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 uh, Jewish men on the street uh, the the uh, the Jews really came from Austria and Hungary and they spoke Hungarian so by nature the natives considered them loyal to Hungary so that was the first overt anti-semitism that I experienced uh, I remember they were dancing in the street uh, celebration the independence of the Carpathian Republic and I went out there and uh, my father came to get me he said you're gonna get killed he, and, he, 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 and I didn't understand what he meant by it but I, I, I obeyed so later on I realized that uh, I was in danger in was anybody actually hurt there there were many many uh, people were hurt over there yes was anybody killed uh, not that I know of, no, I really couldn't tell you. And how old were you at this time? At the time, I uh, was probably about 10 years old. So the, the memory is clear as far as the tumult. It was a huge tumult in the street, and they, would, uh, they were marching up and down, and they were waving the banner of the Carpathian Republic, which was, uh, I know it had yellow, blue, and uh, red. And uh, it, it was... They, they were waving, and the Jews were considered hostile. And that was the first. Uh, later, what happened was Hungary was awarded the Carpathian region because Hungary was part of hung the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and they claimed they had a large Hungarian-speaking population. So they, it became part of Hungary. So abruptly, my education changed from Czech and, and uh, uh, the Russian language that the natives spoke to Hungarian, and they forbid the teaching of the uh, local language. Under the Czechs, the language was taught, but not under the Hungarians. And uh, that was in uh, late 1939. In 1940, my brother with three other people left Rachov. He was at that time uh, 14, 14 and a half years old. They went over the uh, border into what the part of Poland which became Russia. And uh, my father had been taken away to a work camp where most of the Jews of army age Jews were taken. Well, these, these work camps were work that they were performed for the Hungarian army. And um, they wore civilian clothes, and they wore a military cap to designate them as the, a worker soldier. What kind of work did they do? do they, they dug roads. They dug uh, uh, military uh, um, installations where uh, foxholes, and they dug uh, uh, tank traps and things of that nature. Were they paid for any of this work? No, there, there was no pay for that work and, and that caused great hardship in the community because there, there was absolutely no money. Uh, but the community, uh, they, they sort of supported each other and uh, the, the people who, who had farms obviously had produce. We also had sellers. Each one of the houses had cellars and the cellars were really stocked with potatoes and and any of the food stuff that that could really last through the winter the winters were very harsh there. they were very harsh long winters but i remember when uh, when the men were taken away to uh, to the work camps that some of the food was eaten before the winter really set in and so that the following winter things really got uh, got much much more uh, uh, severe. I'm uh, trying to use the right terms, but sometimes it doesn't come out right. Uh, so, uh, when the men were away, who took care of all the farming and the chores? Well, all all of the children that were under army age, 
and um, they, they were put to work and we all, all worked. Uh, he, he, soon after my brother left, they, we were told in no uncertain terms that we could never discuss my brother's departure because the authorities will consider that an act, a treasonous act, and we would be punished for it. So we really never discussed my brother. He just sort of disappeared uh, and, and really never discussed them. We never even discussed them under closed door, uh, behind closed doors. So uh, I didn't find out what had happened to him until after the war when I, I met up with him. When you said that you couldn't discuss it, was it your mother who told but you? My mother told me, my, 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 my uncles told me, my mother told me, my grandmother, that we could not discuss my, my brother's disappearance. It was just a fact, an accepted fact. We, we didn't talk about it. And the, um, uh, then something happened under the Hungarians. They, uh, they uh, passed a law that uh, all the Jewish children, because the, the, the non-Jewish children belonged to uh, a youth organization called Levante. Mm -hmm. And uh, this youth organization taught the children, boys of 12, 13, to uh, handle rifles, how to defend yourself, and all of the military skills that he could impart in those little children. The, the Jewish children, by law, had to then go to this uh, other organization, which was supposed to be like the Levanter, but we really, in fact, did work. You know, we, we had to clean uh, the ditches, which kept filling up. Uh, we worked in the fields. Uh, we we worked in, and um, there there was a um, the river, and the river bank kept eroding. So we we were made to bring rocks and pile them up there so that they could use them as as uh, prevent to prevent the river from eroding. And you so, were about 12, 13 at the time. Uh, I was uh, about 11. Was you still Talking going to school? Uh, we, no, the Jews were then, then not permitted to go to school anymore, but we went to uh, the Haider all day. So we were continuing our, our education in Haider. So uh, after 1940, we really didn't go to school anymore. So you went to Haider part of the day, and then you did this work, or you were doing no, Well, no, but certain days you, you, had to, you had to report for work. You really couldn't, you, you couldn't go to Haider. So uh, when we didn't go to, to these uh, youth organizations, the Jewish youth organization, and then we, we would go to Haider. And uh, I don't think it was structured any longer than such and such a day, you know, that we would go to Haider. It was if, if the time was available, then we would go to Haider. And as time went on, uh, the way they dis disseminated the news under Hungarian it would, uh, that the, a policeman would emerge from the police station and he carried a drum and he had a, a tattoo, a certain rhythm to it. And when he came out and people hear the rhythm, they would start to follow him and he usually would end up in the square and he would then read the daily proclamations. And thereafter he would proceed to in front of a church was a huge bulletin board, and he would then uh, put the, the new regulations onto that bulletin board, because many people couldn't even read Hungar Hungarian. And that is how we got all of these um, anti-Jewish laws, the proclamations, uh, proclamations that, uh, for instance... Oh, we're we're going to continue.